Good morning. Would you please stand and let's worship. Oh 
In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Worship his heart. 
Father, we thank you for the opportunity and the freedom to be here, to gather and worship together. We pray for, that you'll go before us, lead our hearts and our minds, and open us to what you have for us through Nate's word today. Thank you, Lord. Please be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Megan. Welcome to Chesapeake. We are so glad that you're here in worship with us this morning. And if this is your first Sunday, we're especially glad that you're here. And we want this to be a place where you and your family can grow and find community. So after the service, I'm going to be out in the lobby with our Connections team. We would love to meet you. Please stop by and say hi to someone this morning. We also have a Let Us Know card. It's short, but it just lets us know how we can best connect with you. Now, to stay up to date on all the things that are happening here, you can also connect with us online at chesapeakechurch.org slash connect or from our Chesapeake Church app. If you don't have it yet, please take a moment to download it and check it out. There's so many great resources on there that will help you grow in your faith and stay connected here. There's also a digital Bible you can use during the message this morning, or if you prefer a paper Bible, or if you don't yet have one, there is a bookcase in the back of the auditorium. Please take one. They are yours to keep. Now in this morning's message, we're going to be in Psalm 103, if you want to open your Bibles and get ready for that. But first, let's pray. God, thank you for this beautiful day that you've made for us to come together, to praise your name, to worship you, to be together in biblical community. And so we just pray that you take this time to open our hearts and get any distractions out of our mind that we came in here with so that we can focus on your word and what you have for us this morning. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. My name's Nate, and I have a slight confession this morning. Don't say uh-oh yet. Uh-oh. No, so we sang 10,000 Reasons, right? Um, and my confession is that I actually knew all of the words to that song. I had actually led that song, I think, in worship while deployed before I even knew that it was pulling from the Psalms. Um, I just really hadn't spent a whole lot of times in the Psalms. I think I had heard the word poetry and skipped right from Job to Proverbs. <laughs> it's just not, it, it's never been my thing, but that's okay. But it wasn't until the end of last year where I started getting curious about the why behind the what when it came to Proverbs. I was really curious about what drove these writers to write these songs, poems, and prayers. What were the circumstances? So as I get ready to deploy, my always amazing wife, Andrea, buys me a commentary on the Psalms to send with me. So I get ready on day one, and I'm, I'm fully ready to nerd out on it, and um, I crack open. And in the preface, I haven't even reached chapter one yet, in the preface it has a note that says, many people have tried to figure out the who, the why, and the when for the Psalms. Some of them we know, most we don't. Don't try, it's not the point. Oh, okay. So I decided to continue on with it anyway. So I've been walking through the Psalms this year. And y'all, it's been an amazing journey. It has opened my eyes to so much. Um, so this morning, I would like to share with you one that just speaks deeply to me. And as Megan already mentioned, that'll be Psalm 103. If you're not there yet, 
uh, go ahead and open on up to that. And while we're getting there, I just, I can't pass by the moment and not mention how awesome it is that we have the fullness of God's word so abundantly available to us today. Amen. Like an Israelite family might have had the Psalms. And this is actually one of the things I've learned through this journey is the Psalms would have been probably the only book that a normal family would have if they had that at all. So yes, their songs, their poems, their prayers, but there's so much more than that, y'all, because they were made to be these cues for God's people to remember what his scriptures say, to remember who God is and what he does. And there's something about songs, you know, and how we remember things. You know, we teach our kids uh, arithmetic and science and language skills set to tunes because we know that they sink in better and they stick. In fact, I bet you right now, if I just said, say the ABCs, at least 50% of us, I'm hoping because I'm in this crowd, would either sing it or have the tune going in our head while we say it. Yeah? We learned that when we were only a few years old, but that's still how it sits in our minds. And, you know, just a couple weeks ago, we had, um, we had music going in the house, and our girls have been just running through a, a musical soundtrack lately, just nonstop. And what felt like about the 800th time through, it was time to change the pace. So we turned on some good old 90s hits. All right, I'm talking like... Darius Rucker, when we knew him as Hootie, you know, the Goo Goo Dolls, and some lyrics that we clearly did not understand as teenagers. Uh, the Bare Naked Ladies going through one week, that was a good one for the girls to learn. And the thing is, is that despite hardly ever listening to these songs over the last 20 years, the lyrics just started flowing right back out like it was yesterday listening to them. And that's how music does, right? It just seems to linger in the back of our mind forever, doesn't it? And that's what the Psalms are all about too. They're filled with scripture from other places in the Old Testament set to songs and prayers to be repeated like a greatest hits album over and over. And then they'll be waiting in the back of our minds for that passing word you know, like when someone says something just in a, in a random sentence and it cues off a song in your head, parents, what happens if I say, let it go? <laughs> You're welcome. And it's in this way that we are drawn consistently into God's word, reminded consistently of who God is and what he does and drawn into worship. And can we be the, the, honest with each other this morning? We need to be drawn into worship. Or at least I do. I don't know about you all. Maybe you all wake up and from sunup to sundown, you do nothing but think of praising the Lord and act, and act on it. Okay? You leave the tense meeting at work or the argument at home, and you just go into the next room and, and shout the graciousness and goodness of God. Maybe y'all do. I don't. Okay, so that is one of the reasons why Psalm 103 resonates so deeply with me. I don't naturally find myself worshipful in the throes of life. I need to cry inward to my soul to remember that God is still compassionate even when people are divisive and hateful. That God is still gracious even when I try to take control and mess things up. That God is still faithful even when I'm doubting in the middle of a storm. That inward cry to my soul, to cry outward to God in praise, is exactly what we find in Psalm 103 this morning. So, if you're ready, let's dive in. All right, so a little nerding out. So to start out, there are five basic movements in this poem with what I now know is a chiastic structure. I told you I'm not a poetry guy, so this is new to me. If it's new to you too, welcome to the party. But basically it means it flows like this. It, it has an A section, a B section, a C section, goes back to the B, then the A. So our A section 
calls us to bless the Lord. B tells us who God is and what he does. C covers who we are. Then we flow back into a B section with God, and we end as we began in praise with our A section. You guys tracking with me? Okay, two of you. Great. All right, let's look at the first part, verse 1 and 2. My soul, bless the Lord, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. My soul, bless the Lord, and do not forget all his benefits. There's not really a deeper call to our being than our soul, right? But the writer takes it further and includes all that is within me. He's making it clear that this is an every single fiber of our being kind of call. Every part of me, physical, spiritual, emotional, all of it, bless his holy name. And don't forget why, my soul, all his benefits, all those things that God has done, is doing, and will do. Now, it is a curious thing. Anyone else kind of wondering how we as tiny little humans are going to bless a holy, righteous, and perfect God? It's a little crazy, right? So there's something that happens here. Sometimes it's just a little bit difficult to find the proper English word for a Hebrew word. And so if you've got... Pretty much most translations will say bless, but if you're carrying an NIV translation this morning, it actually says praise. And so one of the things last week that Seth differentiated between were a couple words that are translated in English, bless. One of them was barak. That's the one we find here. And what actually might be helpful is its most literal translation, which is to kneel down. This is kneeling in adoration. So what happens if we read it like that? My soul, kneel down in adoration to the Lord. All that is within me, kneel in adoration of his holy name. Hits a little more, doesn't it? And the writer continues in verses 4 and 5 with a reminder of some of the benefits of God, as he puts it. But we're going to skip ahead for now. Don't worry, we're coming back. I don't skip scripture. But we're going to head into that B part of the uh, poem. What, or yeah, what God has done because of who he is. Now, pretty much all of this is referenced to somewhere else in scripture. Check it out. Verse 6. The Lord executes acts of righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He revealed his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. And this is a really summarized way to say, remember the book of Exodus. In summary, like that whole book is God introducing himself to the people of Israel and then showing them what kind of God he is. The author continues in verse 8, he says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love. Now, this is a reference to, and it's actually referencing the most requoted scripture in all of scripture. And it's found in Exodus 34. But before we head over to that, a little context. So Moses has been trekking up and down Mount Sinai, uh, representing the people of Israel to God. Now, the first time he goes up there is when God gives him a set of covenant commandments that we now call the Ten Commandments that he takes back to the people of Israel. Now, imagine those as a marriage proposal, if you will, to the people of Israel. Moses takes them back down. The People are like, yes, we want to marry this God. We'll do all these things. So Moses treks back up the mountain, tells God, yes, uh, they want to be in relationship with you. But he's up there for a long time. He's actually over there, up there for over a month. And the people get restless. They just, they want to have, they got married. They want to have a reception party. Let's get this thing going. So they create an idol. And they start worshiping it as the God who led them out of Egypt. Not something else. They replace him, but call him the same thing. Imagine with me for a moment if you're at a wedding, okay? The 
Bows are done, the I do's are done. The groom goes off to change into his dance clothes for the reception. Bride's like, okay, this is gonna take a couple minutes, but 15 pass, 30, 40 minutes pass. And she's getting impatient. So she walks out to the other groomsman, picks one out, starts calling him by the actual groom's name, kicks off a big old reception party complete with kissing the stand-in groom. Meanwhile, the actual groom has been preparing their life together and making plans and sees this while he's looking out a second-story window. Now, the pastor who married him walks into this reception party and is like, what is happening? This is terrible. Rips up the vows. It's a mess, okay? You got that image in your head? I'm sorry. (laughs) But that's basically what happens between Israel and God. But God says, now I meant my vows. I'm in this for the long haul. So he calls Moses back up the mountain. This poor dude. Quads are getting a workout. But Moses gets up there and God himself shows up and says this. Exodus 34, uh, verse 6. Yahweh, Yahweh is a compassionate and gracious God slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Now, two things here. First, I do know that we're skipping the second half of verse 7, which might seem like a little bit of a cop-out on a difficult conversation. It's not, I promise. First, that is the reference from... Psalm 103, it's only verse 6 and the characteristics of God. Uh, Second, I don't have time to cover everything in one sermon, uh, but if you'd like to talk about that some other time, I would be more than happy to geek out about that. I promise it's not as bad as it might appear on first reading, okay? Second thing, you might have noticed that I used the personal name Yahweh of God while I was reading that, and the screen said, Lord, Lord. I promise I'm not taking scripture out of context, It's a bad juju thing for a teacher if you know your scripture. Um, He actually does use his personal name in this reference. It's just transliterated Lord. So I'm not, I promise I'm not taking scripture in vain here. Anyway, side notes aside. So the writer in Psalms is recalling that first part of God's statement to Moses. Where God characterizes himself. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here either because, honestly, the characteristics of God could be a whole sermon series to itself. But I want us to see one thing. I want us to see that God doesn't characterize himself like the other ancient gods. He doesn't say mighty and powerful. There's no mention of his beauty and splendor. There's no notion of a God who wants to rule over subjects. No. God describes himself in a way that would have seemed altogether weird to these people and what they knew of gods. And that's the thing. Because, see, the people down at the base of the mountain, they created something similar to what the nations worshipped around them, something that they could handle, something they understood, something that made sense to them. But our God wants to be known and to be in relationship with us because of the real him. He wants us to love the real him. And he's different. He's way different than we would create if we had the opportunity to make our own God, isn't he? Even if we call our own God Yahweh, the real one's different. And in a world consumed by greed, by anger, by selfishness and power, isn't it an amazing reminder that we get here that we can be in a relationship with a God who is different, who calls himself compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth. This is the writer making sure that he remembers who he's kneeling before. And then he moves on to verse 9, which is actually another reference that is going to help us paint this picture a little more fully. He's quoting from Isaiah 57 when he says, He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. Small snippet, 
But God actually explains this himself in Isaiah 57. So we'll turn over there and we'll start in verse 15. It says, For the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, says this. So this is God speaking. I live in a high and holy place and with the oppressed and lowly of spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the repressed. I will not accuse you forever and I will not always be angry. And here's where he explains why. For then the spirit would grow weak before me, even the breath which I have made. Because of his sinful greed, his here is Israel, just for context. Because of his sinful greed, I was angry. So I struck him and I hid my face. But he went on turning back to the desires of his heart. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating words of praise. So God knows that if he stays angry with us, he's going to exasperate us. He knows that he will straight wear us out to the point that the breath that he put inside of us will die out. And if I'm being honest, this part kind of reminded me of growing up a little bit. Uh, I gave my mom plenty of reasons to make use of tools uh, like wooden spoons uh, on my backside. And, but judging by the pile of wooden spoon remnants left behind in my childhood, I'd say I was pretty good at doing this turning back to the desires of my own heart thing. See, my behaviors would evolve, but the root didn't really change. I just evolved how I behaved, but within the same, I would do the same things in a different way. You know what I'm saying? And this is kind of how God describes things here. Israel was sinning. God punished them. Israel went right back to sinning. Maybe a different flavor of sin, but same root. And despite knowing that this is how they are, God says he decides to heal them, lead them, and restore them, which creates words of praise. Now we come back to the psalm with this, this whole picture from Isaiah in mind, and the writer continues. He has not dealt with us, as our sins deserve, or repaid us according to our iniquities. So instead of abandoning us or zapping us like a fly going into the blue light in the evening, he heals, leads, and restores us. Because, and this is, this is where we get into God's. Verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love towards those who those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, as so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. Man, I love the imagery that comes in this. Showing that God's faithful love is so great that it dwarfs the highest things that we can see and measure. That he removes our sin. Our acts of rebellion against him as far as the east is from the west. And you know, I heard something on this one time and it just stuck in my brain, so now you get it too. Picture a globe. If you head north, eventually you get to the North Pole. Now, if you keep going, you are now going south and you continue on going south until you hit the south pole and then we you see where we're going eventually if you go north and south you eventually change back in direction but not east and west you can keep going around and around and around in a westward direction and never turn back to being in an eastward one east and west never meet and that is the point that he's making here God takes away our sins so that they never have to be encountered again. He knows what we're like, right? Yet he chose to heal us, lead us, and restore us. 
So now we have the third movement of the poem, and this is the one that deals with us, and it's short. Verse 15. As for man, his days are like grass. He blooms like a flower of the field. When the wind passes over it, it vanishes, and its place is no longer known. Pretty basic concept, right? We're perishable, here, then gone. But compare this to what comes next. But from eternity to eternity, the Lord's faithful love is towards those who fear him. His righteousness towards the grandchildren of those who keep his covenant, covenant, who remember to observe his precepts. The Lord has established his throne and his kingdom rules over all. The contrast between the humans and God is stark, right? Our lives are like grass, quickly gone without a trace. But God has always been and will always be from eternity to eternity. He doesn't wither. He doesn't blow away. His place, his throne is established in heaven to be known forever. Now, notably, this is the fourth time in our psalm that God's faithful love is mentioned. Now, if you were here several weeks ago, Patrick mentioned a word that I've become mildly obsessed with, and that's chesed, and not just because it lets me go, although fringe benefits. Um, No, but mostly because it's a uniquely Hebrew word for a unique covenant love with a unique God. And depending on what translation of the Bible you use and the context it's being translated in, you're going to find it a little bit all over the place here, but you might find it translated as kindness, loving kindness, faithful love, steadfast love, mercy, goodness, devotion, favor. Actually, the list keeps going. And those are all part of it, and they definitely all overlap. But there is no word in our language, in any language except Hebrew, that adequately wraps what this is. So, fascinated with the word. But maybe you noticed that that wasn't actually the fourth time that I've read Faithful Love so far. And you'd be right. Good job. The fourth one is a little bit different, and it's found in those verses that we skipped by earlier. So let's head back to those, but let's read these with a fresh lens of God. A lens who lets us see God for someone who sees our frailty and our rebelliousness, but chooses to remove sins as far as the east is from the west. A God who chooses to heal, lead, and restore us, and who wants us to know him as compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, as a father abounding in faithful love. So here we go, verses three through five. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with good things. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. The order of actions in this passage, forgives, heals, redeems, is in line with a pattern that's established in the whole of Scripture, including the New Testament. For example, in three of our Gospels, there's this amazing, dramatic story of these friends that bring a paralyzed man to Jesus, but they've got to lower him through the roof to get him there. And the clear expectation that they bring is for physical healing. But that's not where Jesus starts. Jesus starts with, son, your sins are forgiven. And this ruffles some feathers in the room. So Jesus says, well, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He turns to the paralytic and says, I tell you, get up. Take your mat. Go home. Jesus' first priority is the forgiveness of sin, the state of our soul. And similarly, in our psalm this morning, forgiveness comes first. 
God's priority is always the state of our soul and our ability to draw near to him. Now look, y'all, I'm not going to pretend that I understand or know why some people find physical healing on this side of eternity and some people don't. But I know there's not a magic code or uh, something that will unlock God like a genie. And I don't know if we will ever know the why behind why God doesn't move how we expect him to before eternity. But I can tell you this with certainty. This is why we are meant to be a community of believers. The church is meant to be a place where brothers and sisters carry you when you can't stand. It's meant to be a place where there are prayer warriors dedicated and persistent in prayer to God, more persistent than the guys calling to renew your car's expired warranty. It's a place full of people who understand what it is to be forgiven and healed. Because before Jesus, every single one of us was in a pit. And that is the word that the psalmist uses. God redeems your life from the pit. Now, the pit is a big hole for a big animal. This isn't a, like, pull yourself up from your bootstraps, try harder, be more clever kind of rut in the road. No, no. This is an intentional trap meant to keep us in it. And y'all, traps are laid on paths where they're likely to catch their prey. That wealth path, man, that seems nice. It's pretty, it's well kept. Flashy amenities and pits. And that politics path seems popular these days. And it advertises the ability to design the world how we think it should be. And it's got pits. Guys, we could do this all day with all of the different paths that this world has to offer. We are broken humans in a broken world. We're going to find ourselves in the traps on these paths. But let's not overlook this. The forgiveness and the healing happen when we're in the pit. The assumption is that we're in the pit. And it's while we're in the pit that he forgives the fact that our, it was our rebellion from him that put us there in the first place. It's while we're in the pit that he chooses to heal us. And then he redeems us, friends. This isn't a he pulls you out of the pit, sets you on the side of it, and says good luck with the rest. No, this is the language used to describe an Israel coming out of Egypt freshly delivered. He's leading them to a new way of life, to be different from everyone else. Even in modern terms, or at least according to Oxford, Oxford Dictionary, Redeem means to compensate for the faults of someone or something. He's buying our freedom. We don't come cheap, friends. We're valuable to him. So valuable, Jesus is the cost. Who paid with his life so that you and I could be rescued from the pit and brought into his family. And when God adopts us, the psalmist says he puts a crown on us of faithful love and compassion. There's my obsessed word again, has said. Faithful love and compassion. These are characteristics of God that he says he places on us as a crown. And crowns cannot be hidden. They are meant to be seen. And he doesn't even stop there. No, verse 5 says he then decorates us. He satisfies us with ornamentation and renews us like the eagle. So when he pulls us out of that pit, you know, we're looking rough. All scraggly and molting like an eagle. But then he brings renewal. And we are given gleaming, youthful feathers like the eagle. And it's this soul who's been forgiven, healed, 
redeemed, crowned and renewed, who comes to the end of our psalm and says, bless the Lord, all his angels of great strength who do his word obedient to his command. Bless the Lord, all his armies, his servants who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all the places where he rules. Bless the Lord, my soul. And look, no matter what side of the bed we woke up on this morning, God is still compassionate. No matter what the balance in our bank account is today, God is still gracious. He is still true. And no matter what the circumstance, he is still overflowing with faithful, merciful, loyal, kind love. And no matter what today's circumstance are or our lifelong circumstances may be, that will never change about him. And for that, for that, friends, from our very souls this morning, we give him praise. Amen? All right, well, we're going to have an opportunity to respond in praise together before we leave this space this morning. We'll praise with our offering. We'll praise with our voices in singing. We'll praise in prayer. And then we'll respond in praise with our lives as we walk out these doors. Now, as we worship with our offering this morning, if you're new with us, please don't feel any pressure to give. You are a guest with us and we're glad you're here. We would love the chance to meet you, whether it's down front in prayer or out in the lobby after service. If you feel moved to give, thank you. Now, for those of us who follow Jesus and call Chesapeake our home, offering is one way that we can respond in praise to a God who forgives, heals, redeems, restores, and renews us. In his faithful love, he provides for us. And in our kneeling adoration and trust, we respond with returning a portion to him. Now you can give right through the Chesapeake Church app. Just tap on that give button in the lower right-hand corner. You can also text Chess Church, all one word, to 77977, or you can drop your offering in the bag as it goes by. Will you pray with me this morning? Father God, we kneel before you this morning in complete adoration of who you are, who you always have been and who you always will be. Father, let our response always be praise. Let these words always be on our hearts, on our lips, and in the back of our mind, just waiting to be reminded of how good you are. God, thank you for your faithful love. Thank you that you are who you are. And we pray that this offering will further the message of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
now if you are new or you're just looking for a fun way to jump in and get connected with us, then we want to invite you to our Food Truck Friday Summer Splash Edition that is happening this week. We're going to be out in Summit Park for a night of community, food trucks, and water games. And you'll have lots to choose from when it comes to the food trucks. We'll have American, soul food, tacos, ice cream, and funnel cakes. Plus, there will be water games for kids of all ages. So for my parents in the room, this is a great opportunity to bring your kids. You get them all sugared up. There's lots of games for them to run around, have a good time. And then you bring them home and get that best night of sleep. So my advice is to come and bring your kids. There's gonna be kiddie pools for the babies. We'll have water guns and a slip and slide for the kids. And then for the teens, you will have splash balls. So you'll have plenty to do and run around. Now just remember to bring money for the food trucks and blankets and chairs to sit on. Now RSVP is encouraged that we can prepare for you and your family. So you can take care of that right now, either online or through our Chesapeake Church app. And we all know someone who could use a fun night out in community. Even if you don't have kids, it's going to be a great night to be out and together. So please think about who you want to invite. Don't forget to RSVP, and we hope that we see you there. Now remember, there are so many ways to get connected here, and this is just one of them. So we would love nothing more than for you to be a part of what God is doing here. So like I said, I'm going to be out in the lobby after service. We would love to meet you, help get you signed up, answer any questions that you have. Or you can connect with us online at chesapeakechurch.org slash connect. And now let's stand and close in worship together.
Man, how can you not leave here and worship with your lives now, right? Amen. Well, we hope to see you next week when we will be rejoined by Pastor Mark uh, Hilson from New Life out in Charles County. Uh, he's going to rejoin us to walk through Psalm 110. So we hope to see you next week. And remember, our prayer team will be down front right after service with the elders and some of our pastors. And we would love to join you in prayer this morning. If not, we hope that we get to connect with you in some meaningful way during the week after service right now. Who knows? Let's pray ourselves out of here and go praise with our lives. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity this morning to dive into your word, Lord, and be just immersed in how your spirit has written it to cue our minds into your words so that we remember your character and who you are and what you do. God, we thank you so much for the blessing of the abundance of your word in our lives. And we hope to never take it for granted. We hope to use every breath to sing your praise, even if we have to cry to our souls before we cry out to you. God, we love you. We thank you for it all. We lift the glory, the honor, and the praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen.